Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 24 of Lippincott's biochemistry textbook. In this chapter we're going over the feed fast cycle. We will be going through the cycle through the eyes of the liver, adipose tissue, skeletal muscle and the brain starting off with the absorptive phase or after a meal and then going into the fasting phase where you haven't eaten anything and there is no dietary ingestion of any nutrients. If you want to support the channel the best thing you can do is subscribe otherwise if you want access to exclusive content you can find that within the patreon link in the description so we will start off with the absorptive phase so after a meal about two to four hours after ingestion there are these four regulatory mechanisms the availability of substrates which almost direct which metabolic pathway is going to occur allosteric activators and inhibitors which relates to the availability of substrates and some certain substrates will allow certain reactions to occur the third regulatory mechanism is covalent modification of enzymes this is going to be the phosphorylation or dephosphorylation of our various enzymes within our metabolic pathways which will then result in a different reaction to occur and then the last fourth regulatory mechanism is the synthesis of new enzyme molecules. So this is purely the increased production or reduced production of those enzymes which are going to be involved in the various metabolic pathways. The goal here for the feed fast cycle is really just to provide glucose as a fuel to all of the tissues the most important of which is being the brain the brain needs a stable amount of glucose if glucose is not available which we'll talk about more in the fasting cycle we need to provide some other fuel for the tissues if you don't have fuel then obviously all the tissues stop working and you die so we're going to start off with the liver and its role in the feed cycle. So when there is a lot of ingestion of various nutrients, all of those nutrients then go into the intestine. Purely the presence of those nutrients is going to result in an increase in insulin relative to glucagon, then gets transported through the portal blood system and bathes the liver in all of this insulin and nutrients. The liver is the first thing that's going to get all of the blood coming from the intestine. So you can see that over here, glucose amino acids, chylomicron remnants, which is our lipid products from our intestine, all go and start bathing the liver. Because of this, the liver now has to switch from an active producer of glucose to a net consumer of glucose because there's so much glucose there. It's also going to handle this amino acids and chylomicrons as well that we'll talk about, but we're going to start off with glucose here. So the liver is going to take all that glucose in via the GLUT2 transporter, and then it's going to convert it into glycogen and also fatty acids. So it's trying to actually reduce those blood glucose levels. It's able to do that because glucose is in such high concentration that it's able to be transported across that GLU2 transporter. Once it's within the hepatocyte, glucokinase is going to phosphorylate that glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate then gets converted to glycogen for two reasons. One, the activation of glycogen synthase, and that's activated because it's being dephosphorylated, and also because of the increased availability of glucose 6-phosphate. Now, we'll just take a quick break here to mention that enzymes involved in the metabolic processes for glucose etc when they are dephosphorylated that often means that they are activated you remove the phosphate which is almost like a deactivator so you remove the deactivator and you activate the enzyme there are three exceptions glycogen phosphorylase kinase glycogen phosphorylase and hormone sensitive lipase which when you remove that phosphate group you actually inactivate that enzyme so in general, dephosphorylation is an activation process, but remember those three exceptions that I'd listed out earlier. So back to the liver with a lot of glucose, it's converting it into glycogen because of the activation of glycogen synthase. That glucose 6-phosphate is also going to result in an increase in ADPH, which is going to then allow the production of fatty acids because you need NADPH to produce fatty acids. And then you're going to have increased glycolysis, which is the actual breaking down of glucose for energy. And that's stimulated because of that high insulin to glucagon ratio and the increased amount of regulated enzymes of glycolysis and so glucokinase, PFK1, P2, 
PK, etc. That's all going to increase glycolysis within the liver, meaning that glucose is going to be broken down. It's going to be converted to glycogen. It's also going to create NADPH, which is going to then create our fatty acids. The last thing that the liver does with glucose is that it stops producing glucose, either through gluconeogenesis, so the actual production of glucose, and also by the reduction in the breakdown of glycogen. And that occurs because of pyruvate kinase being inactivated because of the low levels of acetyl coenzyme A, which are being used for fatty acid synthesis. So that's being shuttled out elsewhere. And also that high insulin to glucagon ratio favoring the inactivation of our other gluconeogenic enzymes. And then glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen being inhibited by the dephosphorylation of glycogen phosphorylase and phosphorylase kinase as we mentioned earlier, those three exceptions. Now, we've already talked about all of these metabolic pathways previously in other chapters, and that's the same with a lot of the metabolic pathways in this chapter. They kind of rehash and go over those pathways once again. The key with this chapter is that it actually brings it all together to really show you how all those metabolic pathways that we had learned previously then actually work in a symbiotic relationship to maintain glucose levels, whether you're eating or not eating. We're not going to rehash absolutely every single reaction because we've already you know, briefly gone over that in the other chapters. Instead, we'll just kind of bring it all together to show you why glucose stays the same when you're eating and when you're not eating. So that's the liver's involvement with glucose. The liver, once again, also produces fatty acids. So the reason for that is because you have a lot of acetyl coenzyme A from the metabolism of glucose and amino acids, which are so high after you eat a meal and also because of the production of NADPH from glucose metabolism within the pentose phosphate pathway. Once again, that's just because you had a lot of glucose and you had the activation of ACC. Now, it rehashes why we have acetyl coenzyme A and NADPH here. The key point here is that the increased metabolism and breakdown of glucose results in increased acetyl coenzyme A and NADPH, which is the substrates that you need to produce more fatty acids. Now the liver with all those fatty acids that it has actually produces TAG or triacylglycerol. And it's able to do that because of all those acetyl coenzyme A's once again, but also because of the hydrolysis of chylomicrons, which are all of the fatty acids and the lipids coming from the intestine. So the liver is producing a lot of fatty acids and it's breaking down all the fatty acids that's come from the liver. It's able to combine that with glycerol 3-phosphate, which is the backbone for tag synthesis due to that increased glycolysis, as we mentioned earlier. And then it's able to package all of these tags into very low density lipoproteins, VLDLs, and then send that into the actual systemic circulation. So then the adipose tissue and muscle cells are able to use it. So the liver is able to get all the fats and then package it up into VLDLs and send it into the systemic circulation. And then lastly here, the liver is able to handle all of those extra amino acids. It does synthesize a small amount of hepatic proteins, but really the main thing that the liver does with all these extra amino acids is just sends them into the circulation for other tissues to use or deaminates them and uses the carbon skeletons to produce pyruvate, acetyl coenzyme A, or other TCA cycle intermediates. The group of amino acids that the liver cannot degrade are the branch chain amino acids. So leucine, isoleucine, and valine, the BCAAs, they do not get metabolized by the liver and instead they go straight through the liver, go to the muscle where it's then either used as fuel or to produce other proteins. So that's the liver in the fed state. Next, we're going to talk about the adipose tissue in the fed state. So this is the other second main source of fuel for the body. And that's because it is just a, a bundle of fat, really. So what happens, as we talked about previously in other chapters, you have high insulin. Insulin is going to increase the amount of glucose uptake by fat cells through increased recruitment of GLUT4. So glucose gets into the adipocyte. Glucose then gets phosphorylated by hexokinase within the cell. That is then going to be broken down, provide glycerol 3-phosphate for tag synthesis. And also glucose is going to enter the pentose phosphate pathway to produce NADPH. Subsequently, all of the extra glucose, the insulin, that's all going to promote tag synthesis within the adipocyte. So you're 
increasing the storage molecule of fat within the adipose site after you've eaten the meal. But we also have those tags that have been sent over from the VLDLs from the liver, which the adipocytes are able to access through lipoprotein lipase. So LPL sitting on the cell is able to break it down, get those tags, suck them into the adipocyte for storage. Next up is the resting skeletal muscle and its role in the fed state. So the resting skeletal muscle, with all that abundant glucose and amino acids and the insulin that's present, it's going to take up all the glucose via the GLUT4, which is being recruited by insulin, it's then going to break down glucose via hexokinase initially and then you know, use that glucose for energy. And it's also going to convert some of that glucose into glycogen, store it for when you're fasting. It's also going to uptake fat coming from chylomicrons and VLDL by the action of LPL, just like in the adipose sites, although it's going to predominantly use glucose for energy rather than fat when you're in the well-fed state. And then lastly, with the amino acids, it's going to increase amino acid uptake and increase its protein synthesis in the well-fed state. It's able to also use BCAAs because of the presence of the enzyme transaminase. Remember, we talked about this uh, not so long ago, how the liver cannot use the BCAAs, whereas muscles can. So it's able to use that for protein synthesis and energy stores. The last organ we're going to talk about in the fed state is the brain. The brain only occupies 2% of the adult weight, but takes up 20% of basal oxygen consumption, obviously because that's such an important organ within the body, and it uses exclusively glucose for energy, particularly within this fed state. The issue is that you need to get glucose across the blood-brain barrier to get into the brain to then be used. The brain also doesn't have any store of glycogen or any fatty acids or anything like that, so it just needs to get all the glucose from the blood. So it has this GLUT1 transporter, which allows the transport of glucose from the blood, and this is insulin-independent meaning that it does not require insulin to transport glucose into the brain. It's always going to be there. So then glucose is always going to be absorbed by the brain whenever it is present. So that's why the whole body is trying to maintain glucose within a particular level. So then it's always being used by the brain, which can only use glucose and doesn't store it. It's just sucking it straight out of the bloodstream and using it right away. So that is the overview of the fed state. The fasted state, however, is the opposite of the fed state, obviously. This is when you do not eat for a period of time, usually after several hours from your meal. We start to get a change in our metabolic processes, which are essentially the opposite of the fed state, to then maintain our fuel stores or our fuel sources for our different tissues. The main one being maintaining glucose for the brain, red blood cells, and other tissues. But our other priority is also to mobilize fatty acids, from our tags to then release ketone bodies from the liver, which are using those fatty acids to supply energy to our other tissues, trying to spare body protein and also spare the glucose being used by the brain. The metabolic pathways are still regulated by those four different mechanisms. So the availability of substrates, the allosteric regulation of enzymes, the covalent modification of enzymes and also the induction or repression of various enzyme synthesis, just as it was during the fed state, but it's really the opposite of the fed or absorptive state. So we have different substrates that are available. We've got different phosphorylation of various enzymes and different upregulation of various enzymes as well to then drive those metabolic processes where we're now using our energy stores, so our glycogen. We're also producing new glucose in the liver, and we're using our other energy store of our tags within our adipocytes to then actually produce glucose for the brain and also ketones for the rest of the tissues to then use as energy. So we're maintaining our fuel sources. So talking about the liver first in fasting, its predominant role is glycogenolysis, so breaking down glycogen to provide glucose, and gluconeogenesis, so producing more glucose, whilst also producing ketone bodies for our other tissues. You can see on this figure down the bottom here, after a meal, you initially just use all your glucose from the meal, but shortly after, you're going to start to break down the glycogen. The glycogen is your major store for glucose 
that starts to be broken down because you have the phosphorylation of glycogen phosphorylase kinase, which then subsequently phosphorylase glycogen phosphorylase. So glycogen is getting broken down and that's going to last for about 24 hours within the liver until it's all gone. We have this overlap of also the production of gluconeogenesis that kind of kicks in a little bit after time um, once the glycogen is being broken down. So then we're able to maintain the production of glucose over time despite there being no glucose within your diet. The carbon skeletons for the production of glucose are derived from the glucogenic amino acids and lactate from the muscle and also glycerol from your adipose tissue. So they kind of contribute some of those skeletons for the liver to produce glucose. The liver will then take all of the tags within the bloodstream, oxidize the fatty acids within it to generate NADH, FADH, and also acetyl-coenzyme A. Acetyl-coenzyme A is then used to produce ketones, and then the FADH and the NADH are going to be used in the oxidative phosphorylation to supply energy for gluconeogenesis to produce more glucose. So we get the production of ketones and also the production of glucose using some of those substrates or the molecules within the tag using the oxidation of fatty acids. Ketogenesis occurs because of all this acetyl coenzyme A within the first few days of fasting, exceeding the oxidative capacity of the TCA cycle. So we've got just too much acetyl coenzyme A to go through the TCA cycle, so it starts to spill over and be produced into ketones. These ketones can then be used by the body for fuel and also the brain once it gets to a high enough level within the bloodstream. This will then reduce the need for gluconeogenesis from amino acid carbon skeletons, preserving our proteins. So we no longer have to break down as much protein to produce glucose because we have ketones. Next, we're gonna talk about the adipose tissue within fasting. The first thing to note is that because we have low insulin, we get the reduced absorption of glucose through GLUT4 because there's less GLUT4 there. And also we have reduced LPL activity. So we've got less absorption of fatty acids from tags just circulating within the body. So the adipocytes are not taking in anything from the bloodstream. Instead, it's actually pushing more stuff out of the cell. And that's because of this PKA-mediated phosphorylation and activation of HSL, ultimately resulting in the hydrolysis of our stored fat tags, enhanced by catecholamines, so norepinephrine and epinephrine, resulting in tags being broken down into fatty acids, which is going to be bound to albumin and used for various tissues for fuel, and also glycerol. Glycerol is then going to go off and be used as a gluconeogenic precursor, so going to be used to produce glucose. So adipose tissues in fasting states, they don't take anything in. Instead, they just push out fatty acids and glycerol. The skeletal muscle in fasting starts to switch from glucose to fatty acids as its major fuel source, particularly after you know, you've broken down all the glycogen within the muscle, used all that glucose, now it's going to start to use fatty acids. That's come from the degradation of TAG within your adipose tissue um, to use that as energy. Remember, because there is less insulin, we have less GLUT4, so less absorption of glucose from the bloodstream. That just allows that glucose to be used by the brain. Instead, the muscle, instead of using glucose, is going to use fatty acids for fuel. After some time, prolonged fasting, when we have increased ketone bodies, it's going to start to use ketones for fuel instead. It's also going to start to break down its proteins within that first phase, and that's going to provide amino acids to the liver for the production of more glucose, or for gluconeogenesis. So initially, it's going to actually contribute to the formation of more glucose by breaking down some of its amino acids and shuttling that over to our liver. After some time though, muscle proteolysis or the breakdown of protein actually decreases with the same decline in the need for glucose as fuel for the brain. So as the brain starts to use more ketones instead of glucose, the muscle needs to no longer provide so much amino acids to the liver to produce that glucose. So once the brain starts to use more ketones, the muscle cells start to break down less protein. The last organ to talk about in fasting here is the brain once again. So in the early days, it's going to keep using glucose for fuel that's being maintained by the liver. 
After some time, it's eventually going to switch over to ketone bodies as the ketones increase within the bloodstream. Once again, this reduces the need for protein catabolism since you're no longer breaking down all those proteins to produce amino acids to go to the liver. So instead, you're kind of conserving some of your protein within your muscle as the brain uses more ketones. And that really summarizes fasting in those four organs. The key thing is that you start to switch from storage to obviously using all that storage to make sure each organ has fuel to be able to do its metabolic processes. There is a bonus organ that it talks about here in the fasting state, and that is the kidney. And that's because the kidney plays two roles with prolonged fasting. One is that it actually contributes a large portion of gluconeogenesis within the body, up to 50% after prolonged fasting. And that's because of its use of glutamine, which has been metabolized from the muscle protein. That glutamine travels around the body, goes to the kidneys, then gets metabolized into alpha-ketoglutarate, to then be used as a substrate for gluconeogenesis. Now, in this metabolism of glutamine into alpha-ketoglutarate, we then also produce ammonia. Now, ammonia is then also very important to help to suck up all of those proteins being produced from ketone bodies and reduce the acidosis that's going to occur with increased ketones within the body. So there's kind of two roles of the kidney. One, produce more glucose. Two, act as a buffer to reduce the amount of acid within the body because of the increased ketone body production by the production of ammonia. So eventually we actually get the switch of nitrogen disposal from urea. Instead, we get the disposal of nitrogen as ammonium. So that is the end of the chapter for today. Here is the flow diagram and also the chapter questions with the answers. Feel free to pause it at any point. Once again, if you want to support the channel, the easiest thing to do is subscribe. Otherwise, feel free to drop a comment and we'll see you in the next one.